All right, everybody. So today we have a man who needs no introduction, Lyle McDonald. How are you doing, man? Howdy. I'm good. Good. Thanks for having me back. Sure. <clears throat> and so, glad for fighting through the email problems we were having. So. Right. Yeah. A little nonsense to make this work, but Sumi, Sumi made it happen. So we, uh, we got in contact, or Sumi mentioned with the new birth control book that you've got yeah. out. So I do want to talk about that, but we also talked about doing some Q&A as well. Sure. Um, and so before we get into that, I do want to mention the charity and it's actually gonna be the same one we had done last time, which is going to be the women's sports foundation. Uh, could just brief primer on, on what that is. It is, it is a group that was started by, um, Billie Jean King, uh, for younger listeners. She was, <clears throat> um, one of the first female athletes, I think to really is in the seventies, she's a tennis player to really break through in the sense of being kind of nationally known and, and especially in the u.s this was a time when women in sports was still a very uh kind of secondary thing and so she started this foundation that is to ensure access um to sport for women um a portion of my women's book sales uh, i donated to them i was able to give them a very big donation last year which was very uh made me very happy um so they're just like they do research i think they fund uh, underfunded sports teams so they just exist to basically to promote women's sports very cool man and uh so we're definitely going to touch on the booklet and first i wanted yeah. to do some q and a's that were sent in so i'm definitely going to read read sure. this one because it's just the wording so somebody had asked do you think that aiming to maximize and increase over time per session volume might lead to adaptations that are different from what we might see with volume that is spread out so that no particular session is especially taxing in that regard does that make sense? Yeah, I think. So they're asking, all right, so let's say you're doing 10 sets on a Monday for a muscle group. I think what they're asking is, is it better to increase that volume in that workout or to spread it out and say have five more sets on Wednesday or five more sets on Friday? Is that is that what they're getting at? Read it to me again. Yeah. Do you think that aiming to maximize and increase over time per session volume? So the way I took it was, is it better to try to like, I guess maybe like the Mike is method of yeah. getting your volume as high as possible over time that you can still recover from compared to just doing a more standard volume, you know, that's not going to kill you in any one session. Yeah. That, that's how I interpreted it. Okay. Like, you know, I, this is obviously part of sort of, you know, the big, the big current debate and, and arguments back and forth and back and forth. And, and I, I, sort of tend towards the middle ground, right? I, very low volume can be effective for time. And I know some people are big on pushing volume and pushing volume as a primary driver. And I don't personally agree with that. Acutely, it is another type of overload. You know, I, I think some of it depends on where you're starting. Right? I had a discussion about this in a different podcast. Like, you know, let's say you start with five sets per muscle group in, in a workout. And rather than adding, trying to add weight, you add a set and add a set and add a set. And when you can do eight sets with a given weight, you add, drop the volume back and increase the weight again. That's sort of an, an old type of progression. It's something called a triple progression. Um, and I think volume up to a point is often you're cutting intensity. And, you know, there was the paper that actually Mike was involved with. I think uh, I want to say that RPS funded it. Um, Cody Hahn and mm -hmm. uh, the guy, I will say Michael Roberts, you know, yep. and what they actually found was that super high volume at a lower intensity, it was suggested it was mostly sarcoplasmic growth in sort of it's the, the non, the non muscle fiber bit. So it's water and glycogen and, and uh, cause they, they did a follow up analysis and said that, yeah, the growth was mainly sarcoplasmic and that's kind of what I would expect, right? The, there's been sort of an idea for why the, you know, volume stress is one component of the muscle. And we know that muscular endurance is built better with volume, right? You need to generate more fatigue. Presumably, if you're stressing the energetic components by doing a ton of volume, that may be, that probably leads to increases in those energetic components, but it may not be as optimal for growth in the, you know, the myofibril or the actual muscle fiber component. And I think that's what their study kind of showed. Right. Um, so I think a lot of it, you know, the issue with just cranking up volume is intensity tends to suffer, right? Obviously, if you're doing three or four sets, you can go all out. And if you're trying to do 12 sets, muscle magazines notwithstanding, right? Those guys are always like, we do high volume and high intensity. Because right. you can't, right. um, it, you, you can't survive it. You know, and there were the two papers out of the other lab that did very low volumes to true failure and found that not only was high volume less, 
not, it was no more effective, it was less effective because presumably they overtrained. So I do think both can probably have their role. You know, that has been something, you know, you do volume first and that may set the base for the intensity better. But I do think the adaptations are somewhat different. I think you may be sort of um, stressing those energetic components more when you push volume less, which is still growth, right? If you're a bodybuilder and you just want to look buff, you don't really care what the growth is, you know, whether right. it's whether it's sarcoplasm or muscle fibers doesn't really make a big, a whole lot of difference. If you're a strength power athlete, probably not so much because, you know, it's whatever non-functional size. So, yeah, I do think the adaptations will be different to some degree. Um, you know, it is worth, I guess it's worth mentioning, even in Mike's paper, you know, they were doing 32 sets per week, but that was across three days, right? Like, I don't want mm -hmm. it to get misrepresented. It wasn't like they were pushing to 30 sets in a given workout because that would just right. be ludicrous. It was something like 12 one day and 10 one day and 10 one day, which is still a lot, but yeah. it was also very sub-maximal intensity. So, um, you know, so could you use that as kind of a base period for four weeks and then lower the volume and push intensity? Yeah, I, I kicked around some sort of theoretical training cycles years ago, kind of, you know, do a few weeks and pump up the volume and higher reps and build maybe some energetic components, maybe some mitochondrial components, because you're stressing that component, uh, that that aspect of the muscle. Um, it is interesting. Uh, there's been a couple of papers that uh, individual mitochondrial function, right? Mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell. Can't ever. That's going to be my joke. That, on, right? That's going to be my joke on my deathbed. That's going to be the last thing I say in this world. And the people that had better mitochondrial function got better growth. And there's some logic to that, right? We know that protein synthesis is very energetically costly. Perhaps being better able to generate energy or have better glycogen stores, better fuel stores, will facilitate growth um, when you get into a higher intensity phase and use lower volume and try to push the weight. So, so yeah, I do think they're different. I do think they can be complementary depending on how you use them, certainly. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I think you mentioned like, you know, bodybuilders don't care what type of growth, they just want to get bigger. But I'm sure in order to maximize size, you're going to want to maximize both uh, yes. as much as possible. Very, very much so. And, you know, there, there are all these, you know, there have been ideas for years that, that sort of got kicked around. You know, you had your pump bodybuilders and they right. looked great, but if they stopped training for, you know, they would shrink. And then you had, you know, your intensity bodybuilders who tended to be, you know, denser. They would talk, they just had a different mm -hmm. muscle quality. Yeah. And when you think about what the sarcoplasm versus the actual, you know, myofibrils, the actual contractile parts of the muscle are doing and represent, you can kind of see where that comes from, you know, and as much and then that, that idea was big for a while, then everyone kind of dismissed it for a while. And now we've kind of come full circle, um, you know, and there, there have been some of those papers that are like, oh, we saw this, this rapid growth in three weeks and they just gained all this muscle with these super high volume things. And then a week later, it's all gone. Mm -hmm. um, right. A couple weeks later, and it's all and it's like real muscle fiber growth doesn't occur that quickly or disappear that quickly. So right. I think short term we we're seeing fluid shifts and sarcoplasm, and then longer term is more, you know, can we should we even worry about targeting those this individually? Maybe maybe not. You know, maybe we do uh, phases. You know, do a four week volume phase, get your work capacity up whatever capillaries, mitochondria, et cetera, do your intensity phase, do a little strength training to bump up your maximal strength. Maybe you do undulating periodization. Maybe you have your volume day, your low rep day, and your middle day. You know, I think there's a lot of different ways to do it, but I do think to a degree we're preferentially targeting, right? right. A lot of, and I, and I, I want to make that specific in the sense that people get really hung up on this idea that, okay, five is strength, eight is growth, 20 right. is endurance. It's not like there's a cutoff. It's not like, oh, five and a half reps, you're suddenly in a It is a continuum. Right. And everything builds something to a greater or lesser degree. It's a more of if you're doing sets of 20 on a short rest period, I'm sorry, you're not using heavy weights. You can't, right? That's mm -hmm. the depletion workouts in my UD2. You're at maybe 60% mm -hmm. of max. If you're doing heavy sets of five with a three-minute rest, 
you're not stressing energetic pathways because you're getting complete rest and bodybuilders are usually somewhere in the middle. Um, so it's a matter of getting preferentially targeted, realizing that, you know, we've got all this data. Oh, if you just set a 35 to failure, you still get muscle growth. Even there, that might be fiber specific. That's still a little bit unclear. But those are also sets to failure. That is distinctly different than what was in Mike's paper where they're doing sets of 10 with a 10 minute rest with four reps in the tank, right? They didn't set the 10 and a 14 rep max. Right, right. I'm sorry, I still contend that's basically a warm-up set, but you do enough of them, you're stressing something. Sure. Um, so yeah, so we're looking at kind of degrees and very, but I do think there's something to that. Yeah, and your comment on how they would say like these bodybuilders, like the pump bodybuilders who lose everything, and you go back to guys like Dante Trudell who would talk about, you know, you gotta push heavy slag iron and that's why these sure. guys who are on steroids, they shrink because they don't, you know, they don't push the heavy weights. And it, yeah. it actually kind of seems to be somewhat true. You know, I mean, who knows if he's telling the truth about what he takes and, and everything, but sure. he's, he's still huge and he's, you know, certainly getting yeah. up there in age. So I, I doubt he's doing anything super reckless. Um, but it, it always does fascinate me how there's these huge, you know, at different ends of the spectrum where he's talking, you know, obviously you're familiar with DC training oh, and... Yeah. I, I yeah. kind of just call it like three sets. I know he says it's like one set, but I mean, he'll say like 15 to 20 breaths. 15 to 20 breaths is like a 45 second rest period. So I just yeah. call it like three sets pretty much, but he's pushing to all out failure on all of those sets. And then you have right. like Scott Stevenson who has his fortitude training and that's maybe more like middle ground. And then you have some of these guys who literally never go to failure. And sure. I mean, all of them have huge guys. So <laughs> it's, it's always sure. interesting to me. You know, and with that, I, you know, once you throw steroids into the mix, as somebody was asking my group about this, like, why don't the pros, you know, follow the scientific guy? Because like, we take enough drugs, it doesn't matter. Like, mm -hmm. and that's, I know that sounds like a cop out and really, Ugh, drugs don't make, no, I'm not saying drugs make you a bodybuilder. Drugs make, build muscle without doing an ounce of training, right? That's, mm -hmm. that's six, still the classic 600 milligram per week study. This guy's gained 10 kilos of lean body mass, some of which is probably water, in 20 sure. weeks. That is more than the average natural can gain in a year of hard training, right? Mm -hmm. So I think as soon as you start looking at what the pros are doing, you will see a million different things work right. from because steroids, as Dan Duchesne once put it, covers up so many of the mistakes. Now, when I think you look at naturals, big naturals are always strong. Now, people go, but they're not power. I'm not saying they're power lifter strong. I'm not saying right. they're one, one RM strong. But relative to where they started, they are always lifting pretty damn heavy weights, right? They mm -hmm. will be squatting in the high threes or low fours, maybe higher. They will be benching in the high twos to low threes for reps. And that is very, and very different than trying to maximize your 1RM through arching and technique and neural pathways and all of that. Right. Now, they also typically do a little bit higher volume. And I'm not saying they're always trying to go heavier and heavier and heavier. But if you then look at the naturals who haven't added weight to the bar, they don't get any, I don't give a damn how much volume they do. They'll grow for a little while. And you can prove that by going into any gym of the, any gym right. in the world, any day of the week and look at the guy and look at the guy the next year. If he's still benching the same way, he'll be no bigger. So they're always stronger than they were. Sure. But then people hear that and go, oh, so should I do the, the, the HIT thing and add weight every workout? Well, no, I'm not saying that either. This is a progression over time, and they may do volume for a while because they can't physically add weight to the bar, and that's a better way, you know, because obviously if you push heavy weights all the time, you might get burnt out, you might get hurt. A lot of things can happen. Um, one thing, you know, with, with dog crap, and Dante's an old friend. We used to be old nemeses, and then, you know, we all grew up and got older and put aside much of our uh, youthful digressions and you know i like dog i think dog crap is an extremely well thought out program you know i will argue about how many sets it is too right like if you mm -hmm. look at say like myo reps and you get some of the rest pause stuff you see a thing where one set is the effect like i know blade says that one myo rep set is like three or four regular sets so right. it's, you know dante dog crap is somewhere in the middle depending on how many breaths you take um I know some people that grow great on dog crap. I know people that just get burnt out with the constant going to failure. Right, right. right. Because it's even in even in the cruise, it's you go to concentric failure, and then in the blast, you're doing the 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 rest pause and the, the rest pause stuff. 
and that can break people over time. Sure. Um, but you know, but he, you know, I, I, and I still honestly think as again, it's a very well thought out system. You do, you know, your rest pause set, you usually do the loaded stretching, which I still maintain is mainly a loaded eccentric. Cause if you watch mm-hmm. the guys do it, you know, they're here and it's just this super slow negative, which does mm-hmm. lots of things where I think he really, a big part of the reason he got the results he did is he took all these guys that were in the gym focused on the pump, squeeze, and this and that, and said, you got to get stronger. And right. he got them to, quote, unquote, beat the record book. And it got these guys that had been, you know, faffing about for years to finally focus on adding weight to the bar. You know, he had other things built in where you rotated exercise and this, that, other. You know, but that can burn people out in the long term. So maybe cycling these is kind of the way to go. Um, and I think if you look at most naturals, a bit, big picture, that's what they sort of end up doing. You know, they may not be adding weight to the bar weekly, probably not. Bi weekly, probably not. You know, I've told folks once you're at the advanced intermediate, you're not adding weight to the bar every workout. You're just not. Yeah. So set your volume, set your load, stay there every fourth week, take a set to failure and see where you're at. And if you get more than you know, if you've got, if you get more than four, if you're doing sets of eight and you get 12, it's time to add some weight to the bar. Yeah. Um, because I mean, it's not I as, that pretty good. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, and it's not as if a given weight on the bar stops being a stimulus instantaneously. Right. And right? if we need to be whatever, in between 65 and 80% or 70, 80%, right of your maximum it's not like your maximum every week is going up by 10 percent. and so if you're a beginner maybe so it's right. like okay you're at 80 percent, and suddenly your max has gone up if you're lucky by one percent well you're still at 79 percent, and this and then eventually it's no longer a sufficient load and you go up in weight and you know so you kind of end up in practice alternating them anyway you know me right. because i'm lazy i just set the volume where i think is midline optimal Stay at that weight. When it gets lighter, yeah. go a little bit heavier. Move on with your life. Um. <laughs> yeah, I like Dante. Um, I like his posts. I think they're, you know, have these, like, motivational posts. And, and they're good. They get people, like, yes. off their ass and, and to, you know, work hard. Yes. Um, there's certainly things I, I disagree with. You know, he had a lot on the importance of fasted cardio, which I think most people in the evidence-based community, if you want to call yeah. it that, would disagree with. He was always pushing uh, two grams per pound of protein, yeah. which... I did for years and, you know, I was 160 yeah. pounds eating, like I had like a reputation at <laughs> like the protein, college. Yeah. yeah. Like they'd always have to give me more chicken breast. I was eating 350 grams of protein and it was Jeez. just, yeah. Um, <laughs> so there's some things I disagree with, but of course the main thing I, I always talk about is like progression over time, which yes. he, you know, he, he pushes a lot. Um, and, and to be fair, one thing I will say is people might ask me questions. Oh, well, does this matter? Does this matter? And I used to say years ago, of like, well, just focus on getting stronger because, you know, the guy who is bench pressing 315 for five is going to have a bigger chest than the guy yeah. who's bench pressing 225, that whole thing. Yeah. However, I will say that that's a very simple answer, but it's like, how do you get that strength increase? You know, it's okay. not just putting heavier weight on the bar. It, uh, it yeah, could so- be I need to add volume over time, you know, to a point to get yes. that. No, yeah, and I don't disagree with that at all. It's it's with it, without qualification, without being very specific in what you're saying, a lot of these sort of quick answers can get very easily misinterpreted, right? Because then you, you look at, like, say, you know, the, the high-intensity training group. Like, oh, yeah, those guys often get very strong doing that one set to failure every, you know, fortnight or whatever they were doing the last time I looked. Yes. But they didn't really get the size gains out of it, right? And, and I wrote this really uh, – it started very technically and then went completely in a different direction. I talked about sort of, you know, what we know about the stimulus. And we know that we have to recruit the muscle fiber with high tension – but there is some number of contractions that is required to optimally turn on the muscle growth process. And this is all on my website. It's called Muscle Tension. I think it's called Muscle Tension Part 1 through 4. And it starts out super molecular, and then it has nothing, the, the next three parts have nothing to do with that. It is just addressing what does tension mean? Does heavier weight on the bar always mean more tension? Can it mean less? Can lighter weight on the bar mean more muscle? Like it's set. But anyway, we know that there's a certain volume. So yeah, these guys are like, ah, I do that one set of eight to 12 all out and then I'm burnt for a week and I got stronger, but I didn't really get bigger because they're probably mm-hmm. either at too low of a volume per session or too low of a frequency. All right. 
I remember the big, the most cutting edge thing, and this was about a decade. This was, you were probably still in high school because mm, I'm old yeah. and I, I remember all of this stuff from the internet. And the HIT guys, it was like one set all out. I, and they were just blowing themselves. They were burnt out once a week or once every 10 days per, per exercise. And then the new HIT guru, whose name I forget, came through and said, you know, what if we only go to failure every other workout? Which, A, is not no longer high-intensity training. Mm -hmm. However, suddenly these guys were like, wow, I can train more frequently because I'm not burned out all the time. And yeah. wow, I'm growing better. And we were all like, wow, what have we been telling y'all for a decade? <laughs> but it was like such a mind-blowing thing for them. And because, it, you know, and there's other ways to go about that. You know, there's always the, the interaction between volume, intensity, and frequency. If you want to do all the volume, you can probably do it one day a week. Or you got to spread it out. Or you got to cut your intensity. If you want to go all out, sets to absolute limit failure, you've probably only got three or four of those in a workout. And right, anybody, sure. and, and let's face it, most people don't know where failure is to begin with. That's a whole separate conversation. Mm -hmm. People think they're training to failure. And I defy, if you're ever in Austin, just... <laughs> Find me, and I will show you how far away from failure you truly are. But right. which is then a problem with like, oh, train three reps from failure. Nobody knows where that is. If you've right. not trained to true limit failure and had someone take you there, by basically the old joke was when you think you're at failure, if I put a gun in your face, you'll get one sure. more. Sure. Right? right. Most people have never gotten there because they and they don't. So to tell them to stay three away, they're nowhere close. Right. Regardless. So the HIT guys took it to that extreme, right? We'll just do one all out set and they got stronger, they didn't really get bigger. You got the guys that just pump and pump and pump and add, you know, either add volume or don't add anything and they don't get anywhere. And then there's a happy medium and there's, you know, dog crap. Maya reps are probably more towards the intensity spectrum. Hypertrophy specific training, more of a volume, use more of a frequency approach, if you're familiar with that. Um, trained th each muscle group three times a week in two-week cycles, and you added weight from a sub-maximal point to a new rep max, and then you drop reps, and it looked a little bit like an old powerlifting cycle, you know, my generic bulking routine, right in the middle, twice a week per muscle group, eight heavy sets, couple reps off of failure, got some that are, you know, but within this, there's this workable range where I think you'll see it, it'll all, and it may all work at different points. There may be an individual factor, Right. Yep. Some people, like I said, cannot handle going to failure all the time. It just burns them out for whatever reason. Nervous system, I don't know what, why that is. Um, some people don't, you know, don't have the work capacity to do a lot. I think it could be biological. It could be a lot of things. Um, where the research is going now, and I, I think in the next year or two, we're going to see a big upheaval in resistance training research. Because yep. a couple of papers have, like, usually what do we do? We compare two different workouts and 10 people apiece and then compare them and go, aha, this worked better than that. What these studies did is they had the same individual do two different training programs for each arm or each leg, mm -hmm. right? Using basically they were their own control or their own comparison, an intersubject an inter comparison within the same, rather than in, intra, did I get that backwards? Whatever. They're comparing one person to themselves versus one person to another person. And what they found was that the individual differences, I'm going to get this wrong, were like 10 times greater. No, the differences between two different people were like 10 times greater than in any given individual. Basically, the people that responded well to training program one mm. responded well to training program two. I just made a video about this actually, because yeah, are you talking? There was um, one of the articles most recently was like why your workout, why your gym partner's workout might not work for you or something like that, and it well, was touching on on that study. I, I think the difference might have been more than ten times actually. But it, well, it was, yeah, it was something stupid, and they were just yeah. like, and and the basic conclusion we can draw is like basically if you're going to grow well, you're going to grow well, and if you're not going to grow well, you're not going to grow well. So what these what the previous studies are end up comparing is not so much the different workouts, the different loading parameters as two different people mm -hmm. who is a high you know and even if you go back and look at at uh, the Cody Hahn paper that Mike Isertel was on averages are great average results are fantastic and when they show the individual results it's staggering because when they went back to reanalyze that paper right of the 30 people like here was the midpoint where there was zero growth is about half and half mm -hmm. half the people got smaller on high volume 
right? <laughs> and that tends to get left out of the discussion. And this happens in diet studies, too, especially in control sure. diet studies. Half the people, so one guy loses 30 pounds and one person gains and the, it, it averages out to nothing. And they had to set a cutoff. They're like, we're only going to look at people that grew above a certain amount because that's the limit of our measurement capacity. Right. It was only like 10 of the 30 people made the cutoff. Right. So we've got this situation that if you're a high responder, you're a high responder. And we're right. starting to identify. I mentioned mitochondrial density. Uh, capillary density was recently shown to be important for older men. Right. If you don't have good blood flow. And it's funny because Perillo 20 years ago was talking about using high rep sets to improve capillaries and aerobics to improve capillaries. Mm -hmm. Not all bro science is stupid. A lot right, of it right. ends up being, you know, um, there's been a recent thing, ribosomes, which are the, basically they're the cellular things that take genes and turn them into proteins, right? right? And they're critical, is the people who were able to synthesize the mo new ribosomes the best grew better than those who couldn't. Mm -hmm. And this right. is genetic, right? Now, I would love to find a way to, you know, I just... Mark my word, I'm going to go trademark this. The, ribos the ribosomal training program is coming. Someone's going to, <laughs> get, I hope to see because, but it's, but we're, so what we're finding, like I said, is that these, in, within any given individual, like you may be the guy who, for whatever reason, you respond to volume and not to intensity right. and vice versa. I think you're right about dog crap going back to that. The big difference is it just got people off their asses, right? Martin Birkin, Martin Birkin calls it, though he used a little bit different term, F around itis. Mm -hmm. And he's like, look, you're all going and faffing about for two hours. Yeah, he still does pretty low volume. And he's, I don't know if yes. he's taking anything or not, but he's a, he's a pretty huge I, guy. Yeah, I think he's, I, I, I seem to recall, I don't follow him too much, that he's changed a little bit in recent years in terms of not being as low volume. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so like... But those are the two extremes. And if nothing else, and I've said this for a number of years, you have to spend some try, time training low volume, high intensity to know where any of this, where any of these endpoints last mm -hmm. and, or are. You don't know what failure is till you've done it, till you've gotten on a hammer machine and pushed till you can't put, like, don't do it on squats, don't do it on RDLs. I did 20 rep deadlifts one time. Don't ever do that. It's a right. horrible, horrible, horrible mistake. But you need to get on a leg press, you need to get, and you need to have some psycho like me take you through a set till you want to die. And then you'll, because I did this on my group, and I put up some videos, and people Solos, were like, yeah. wow. And I was like, they're like, wow, I, what I thought was failure was seven reps from. I go, yeah, you don't trust me. You, and I did. I spent a lot of time in my youth, that hard gainer stuff, low volume, grinding, 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 grinding. Now, you and I, I actually had a little bit of back and forth in that under your video. Okay. Um, and something that I had mentioned was it, that is always a surprising thing to me because I agree with you. And one of the yeah. comments I made is like, I wonder if an athletic background is a factor because I, I was an athlete from a young age. Um, so was my brother. And I, I'd like to think I'm pretty objective in how hard I push myself. And I mean, even early on, I would kill myself i mean I literally on leg days i would dread them days in advance and i had i had like twice personal trainers come up to me and ask me if i was okay because i was just yeah. like on the floor and yeah. my brother within like a year of training i mean he would re like i really don't think i mean i don't know like if a gun is your head maybe one more but i mean he point is yeah. he would push very very hard yeah. but certainly in a, in a regular gym you don't see that that often um and i don't know if it's just a personality thing if it's that sports background um but that was the comment I brought up there. I think, yeah, I think that's actually a big part of it. I think when you have that competitive background and are used to, for lack of a better word, suffering, mm -hmm. not only are you able to, because, and they are, some of the studies are like, well, there's, there's, you know, momentary muscular fa failure, and then there's volitional failure, which is where most people just go, okay, I've had enough. Right. And, you know, and they may not, they, they think that's failure and because that's usually because they haven't ever really been pushed harder and harder and harder. You know, I don't know what your coaches were like, but good coaches will kind of nurture that and they'll see that you think you're done and they'll get you to do that little bit more and you realize, okay, there's always a little bit more to give, you know, and that is, that's one characteristic of great athletes is the ability to suffer. You hear that from cyclists. Every time you think you're done, just keep telling yourself you've got a little bit more, but you have to, you know, I said, I did that training because I believed in it and I would push till the bar wouldn't move and then 10 second isometric and then a slow negative and, and I'll tell it, well, so you mentioned, you know, the personal trainers, my, 
a training partner I had years ago, one of the most intense guys I've ever met. He started when he was young, trained his whole life. He was a monster, four or five by five full squat, five, got five, five, 220 pounds. We were squatting one day, doing heavy fives, and we did that old Hatfield holistic, tra holistic training. So you do mm -hmm. two sets of fives, two sets of 12 to 15 on a different exercise. And then rather than sets of 40, we would do timed two minute sets. So we do like two by five in the squat, two by 15 in the hack squat, two minute sets on the leg extension of continuous tension. It was gross, it was a horrible, it was just awful. <laughs> he finishes his second set of fives, grindingest, miserable set, racks the bar, literally collapses in the squat rack. I go, dude, yeah. are you okay? And he just looks up at me and goes, leg extensions. Like this, he, he <laughs> did, there's an old holistic program by Hatfield. Hatfield didn't believe that there was overlap between muscle fibers, which mm -hmm. is nuts, but Hatfield's a little bit crazy. So he, one of his workouts was you would do a set of five in the squat, immediately go to hack squats for 15s, go immediately leg extensions for 40, go immediately back to the back squat because there was no overlap. Yeah, right. Yeah. My, my partner, training partner did this got off the leg extension machine, he was crawling across the gym floor to get back to the power rack, right? Because yeah. your legs are <laughs> like your legs are done, right? You cannot stand up after that. He was trying to get, like, that's the intensity with which he trained. And yeah. again, I'm not saying everyone needs to go to that all the time, but if you've never been there, you don't have the first clue where it is. Right. And I do think, again, we're dog crap and we're Martin. It was like, look, you guys are at this extreme, come to this extreme for a while, and then maybe you can find a happier medium or alternate or whatever. So, so that's yeah. a very long, long answer to that question. Do you know, uh, you know, Tom Benuto? Oh yeah. He's, he's a friend of her. One of the best guys in the industry, his book. Yeah. He's great. Even though there's a couple things I disagree. I don't, he's still on the six meal per day thing or was the last time I looked beyond that, his book, burn the fat, build the muscle is still one of the best books I've ever written. And I cannot too highly recommend it, but yeah, he's a friend from way back. Yeah. He, um, he and I talk occasionally now, which is really cool for me because he was probably one of the guys who got me into it. I, I read his book yeah. when I was maybe like 14. So I, I'd been in it, but not as seriously. Yeah. And he wrote a program for somebody else, you know, in a, a book there. And the leg workout, the one that I would dread on Saturday, it was, you know, when they say like breathing squats, right? So like you pick a 10 rep max, but you somehow yeah. force yourself to get 20. He had oh, yeah. two sets of 20 breathing squats followed That's by hack squat supersetted with leg press it was like 8 to 12 and 12 to 15 three sets of those straight legged deadlifts those ones killed me because by that point i just wanted to throw up sure. three sets of that and then superset like a leg curl with something else it was it was like a really that's, dreadful workout like, that's, an imp that's an impossible workout frankly i don't even think that's to do two to do two tr true 20 rep breathing squats no that's inhuman like i, yeah, I did was, that um, when I was younger, I did that for years mm -hmm. and I'll tell you now, now what people don't know historically, the 20 rep squat was a back offset. Originally guys did mm. five by five, two warm ups, three grinding sets of five, and then a back down of 20. That's how uh -huh. it was originally used. We're talking early 20th century. So I did that routine for a while. I actually think I did yeah. three warm ups, two just crushing sets of five, as much weight as I could use. And then I would strip the bar and I would finish with a set of 20 and then I would go lay down for a little while because that's all you can do after that workout. I can't imagine doing more. And I did this for months on end. Mm -hmm. Just in every workout, if I got my reps, I would add five pounds or two and a half pounds, whatever it was, that was the goal. Right. And I remember one day, and I would start, I would get anxiety attacks walking from my car to the gym yeah. because it was just such a terrifying. And one day I did my sets of five and I stripped the bar and I looked at that bar and I went, I can't do it. And I never did them again. <laughs> really? I just, I did it because I did them for way too long. Like that's, yeah. that's like a six week specialization program. That is not a mm. months on end program because your brain will, you will just eventually break yourself. So sure. final thing and we'll move on. My, one of my mentors who nobody will know who he is, uh, so I won't bother, and he doesn't like to be named. I'm actually not in contact with him, so I'll just say. Uh, he goes to another school and lives in Canada and leave it at that. He had one of the most vicious variations on the 20-rep squat I've ever run into. And I did, only did it once because I only actually met him face-to-face -face one time. He is, I knew him on the Internet for about 17 years. So you do your set of 20 breathing squats. Then you get assigned penalty repetitions meaning any rep that he was not happy with, and that could be lifting speed, depth, anything he wasn't, you had to redo those. 
So it could be zero, or I guess it could be 20. Usually it's a handful. Mm. After that, you then tried to get five more repetitions where you either got the five or descended, got stuck at the bottom, and dumped the bar. Right? That's when you, and again, I don't necessarily recommend taking squats to failure is an iffy proposition. It can be done. Yeah. I've done it. I wouldn't recommend it. You know, people miss singles and done that sets, sets to reps to failure where you descend, get stuck, try to come up and have to dump the bar. So mm -hmm. I don't recommend training like that, but you will learn something very valuable about yourself. Doing it. But that is one of the most brutal, like it was just vicious and brutal. Yeah. And you did one of those like once a week because it was inhuman. Um, so yeah, so like doing that to teach people what pushing is, is valuable. Doing right. it all the time, you either get hurt, joints wear out, which is another consideration, right? Is connective tissue is still like the lost, the forgotten tissue in training. Nobody talks about it. Right. And that wears out. Doing higher reps and lower, you know, lower intensity, higher volume can be very good for joints and connective tissue. So there's a good reason, you know, to do a three or four week block with some more volume. So right the um you talk about like it's almost like a specialization phase or you know something that you should just do for a short period of time one thing that was talked about more a couple years ago for a while i mean to the point that i heard some coaches saying that once you're in an advanced stage you can only really progress with specialization phases oh, yeah. um how do you feel about that for hypertrophy you know if somebody's pretty much at an advanced level do you think because from my own personal experience, yeah, like if I did an arm specialization, they, they would get bigger, maybe a quarter yeah. inch in that period. I don't know if I would say that that really lasted, though. So in terms of lasting hypertrophy, do you think once you're at that advanced stage, you're kind of just done? Or do you think you can eke some more out with true specialization phases? <laughs> well, I think it's I think it's a little bit of both. On the one hand, once you get to an advanced stage and for a natural, like once you put in three or four years of like really productive, progressive training and gains, you know, as a dude, if you're lucky, 30 to 40 pounds of muscle from where you started, mm -hmm. you're done, right? At that point, I don't care what you do. The only thing that will make you bigger is steroids. And right. nobody wants to hear that, but this is just the truth of the matter, right? And as I put it, like at that point, you're basically just peeing into the wind. Mm -hmm. it, 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 you're fighting the, the inevitable decline of age at this point. The amount you're going to you, – you hear about these advanced guys. They are scraping for a pound a year. Yeah. Eh, I guess, yeah. Uh, at best, I got better things to do. Now, I do believe that even as you enter the advanced stage, and at that you're probably looking at maybe three years of progressive training. Oh, yeah, I've been saying you should switch to specialization phases for over a decade. Like, I was saying that back in the 2000s. For the simple fact that we know that to bring up, and this is true of any sport, right? This is true of any activity. You need a certain amount of volume, a certain amount of intensity, a certain amount of frequency, right? You have to have a stimulating load. And that what that is will depend. But once you get to an advanced stage, assuming you need a fairly moderate, fairly high volume and a fairly high intensity and a fairly high frequency, how do you do that for a muscle groups? Mm -hmm. There is right. no human way to either do the training or recover for it from it. And at that point, you are in my specialization programs have always been you pick two muscle groups, usually one upper, one lower, and you just hammer it for like about six weeks like you just absolutely your goal is to go hard heavy with more volume add weight as often as humanly possible well you keep everything else on maintenance and maintenance is very easy two to three heavy sets once a week will get it done right four if you're neurotic but you just don't need a lot of work to maintain muscle groups the yeah. same training partner he we put him on a hamstring specialization for a year he maintained his quads with like three heavy sets of leg extensions uh, mm -hmm. for about a year because he couldn't squat because once you RDL for five by five and do leg curls for four by twelve, you're kind of done on squats. Right. So you don't. So, so I would do that and do that for six weeks. The key is that when you rotate muscle groups, you have to maintain the previously specialized body parts at a sufficient intensity and volume so that you don't just lose it. So, right. but they, basically, you bring them from whatever that eight or ten sets twice a week to two to three sets, but you keep the weights heavy. And I, I tend to find so because and you see that in most sports. Right, powerlifters reach a point. How can you put enough energy into squat, bench, and deadlift? Like it's hard enough to do squat and deadlift as an intermediate powerlifter because those are both exhausting, and usually you just use the squat to kind of build the deadlift and hope for the best. And bench is kind of its own thing, but you may be better off picking one lift to focus on and rotating. Sure, I know I've seen triathletes talk about this. You get to a point. How can you do? How can you ride 
30 hours a week and run 20 hours a week and swim 12 hours a week. Right. I don't think that even allows time for sleeping at that point. Like you cannot be a full-time athlete in all three. And so they'll just focus on one for six to eight weeks and bring up their bike and you know, bike and running have more carryover and swimming is right. just its own, its own funky thing that lives outside of any other sport. So like, yeah, so I think, you know, beginner stage, six to months to a year, that intermediate stage, I still want to focus mainly on getting stronger, moderate volumes and frequencies, you know, my generic bulking routine, as people get stronger, trying to go heavy twice a week just becomes impossible. Right. You just, you just get ground down. So then you switch to something maybe like, you know, Lane Norton's got his PHAT program, where that, you get a, yeah. a heavy day and a pump day. And I think that's perfect. As long as you get them both. Um, it's funny. I'm watching guys. Like, oh, you know, the emergence of power building guys. I've been in this industry for 25 years. This is not new. Mm-hmm. Everything just goes through phase. Like, ah, you do heavy work and then volume work. So it's tension and fatigue. It always has been. Anyway, so like you get to that advanced stage, year two, maybe three, where you're getting too strong. One heavy day, one pump day. I know some people have, you know, the butt, the trash day where they do whatever miscellaneous body part. Mm, yeah. And then once you're at the three year mark, you're probably better off going to full blown specialization, rotation, rotating which muscle groups you pick. And then at year four, you're done. That's yeah. it. You're not, you're not <laughs> getting any bigger. I got that. Just sorry. I know guys want to just grow forever, but. That's pretty much it. So, no, I have a pretty, unfortunately, I have a pretty pessimistic attitude when it comes to it, too. And it's not, I don't mean to like hate on the people who think that they're still progressing, but I know, I won't say who it was, but I saw somebody <laughs> recently and he had a post and he was talking about a specific body part. And he said, somebody asked him, like, oh man, how'd you get, you know, that body part like that? And uh, the person said, oh, well, 30 years of lifting. And yeah. I was like, dude, I know what you looked like after 10 years. You looked the same to like yeah. anybody who's not a bodybuilder. You looked identical. Yes, and so exactly. like, I'm not, it's frustrating because it's like, it's almost like when, um, I don't know, like it's good that people are focusing on being consistent, right? The more important message for probably most of America is like be more consistent, right? You could say that with like yes. a lot of things like dietary oh, yeah. habits too, even if they're doing it for the wrong reasons, if Absolutely. you're eating less, great. So I don't want to say like, no, like you're putting the wrong message out, but for the smaller percentage of people who are already super consistent, you are making them think that if they just put another 20 years in, they're going to get that. And it's, it's just not even remotely true. And it does bother me because I think probably because I was affected by that too. You know, I started at a young age, so I, I certainly progressed longer than four years because I started when I was 12, you know, (laughs) but, but by the time I was 22, I mean, I, I I'm 28 now. I haven't grown in six years, really. I mean, in terms of like noticeable to other people kind of a thing um it's very small and four years maybe i could say five or six but again that's because most people aren't doing it optimally anyway for those four years so um yeah i I, either yeah you know i I tend to throw out three or four years of proper training it's it it could be a little bit longer some people get there a little bit sooner depending on you know as someone in my group put up pointed out recently goes this is assuming optimal progressive training consistently because life gets in the way, work gets sure. in the way, family gets in the way. You know, it's not like most of us are, are training perfectly and consistently for those three or four years and we've got whatever drawbacks and get sick and holidays and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, once you've hit, you know, on average, probably 30, maybe 40, 45 pounds if you're lucky over mm-hmm. your post-pubertal weight. Right, and that's right. important because I've seen people make some real, oh, I've gained 80 pounds. Yes, yeah, since you were 12, Right, I'm not exactly. talking about puberty, right? You would have gained right. that 30 you know, or, or they're like, oh, I took some underweight kid and put 40, right? Because you got him caught up, right? Yeah. He, he, he was 110 pounds when he should have been 160 after puberty. So like, don't tell me your magic training program and, and gallon of milk, oops, uh, did that to him, right? right? You basically got him caught up to where he should, but you take the average guy who starts at 160 after puberty and you get him training and if he's lucky, he'll get to 200 and yeah. he's probably not going to be that lucky. And right. anybody that is listening to this that goes, no, you don't know my work ethic to them. I say, <laughs> go, cause I hear that shit all. That's an American thing. Go to any natural bodybuilding contest. Right. See who the biggest, see which class is biggest. It's the 165s by and large, right? Mm-hmm. The, these are the most, the, the elite, Genetic, natural bodybuilders who are doing everything right, training just as intensely as any human, eating all that stuff, and they come in a contest shape 
165. And when you see them in clothes, they don't look like they lift. When they, right. in their posing suits, they look amazing, right? Now go look at how many guys are in the heavyweight class. How many 180s are there and how many 180s are in shape? Hmm. Now go to the super heavyweight class. See how many guys even make it to the 220 weight class or whatever it is. See how many are conditioned. Now there's more now than there used to be. Yeah, certainly. But I, and I think, uh, I want to say Greg Knuckles has written about this. He said that if you look at average performance in those sports, it hasn't changed. Right. But if you look at outlier performances, mm. you see more freaks, right? So we know that I'm going to mispronounce his name and, oh, Nasima, N-S-I-M-A, maybe you know who I'm talking about. He is a gigantic, he's got a, uh, he's got a very foreign name, and I'm sorry that I'm getting it wrong. When I ran some numbers, he is gigantic. Um, yeah. He is African American. I, I I don't think he's Kenyan because that wouldn't really go with. It. Regardless, he's just enormous. Like, yeah. and I do I do for I actually I do believe. Like, I know there's the fake natty thing. I do actually believe he's natural, but he's just like because we're getting more people going into the sport, and when you sure. do that, you're going to see more genetic outliers. But here's the thing. Everybody can't be an outlier because that's not right. what the word outlier means, right? <laughs> the average guy, and I guarantee you that when he started training, right, because he competes at like 230 ribs, guarantee wow, you really? he started, or it's something in that range. Like he's close to where Arnold was at his peak. Like the guy is just, it, it's Nasima N-S-I-M-A is his first name, and I can't, his last, I just don't remember, and I'm sorry yeah. for that. Regardless, I guarantee you he probably started at 190, right? He was probably... Big, big guys, big, big guys started as big guys. Right. Little guys don't ever become big, big guys by and large, right? You don't start at 140 right. naturally and suddenly you're 220 and lean. You can get right. to 220, but it won't be a good 220. Sure. So big guys start big and literally you're just only going to gain some. And I know nobody wants to hear that. And so the work ethic and it's like, again, go look at the, the, the average natural has not – the average weight of like in shape naturals really hasn't changed. Right. Well, to me, it's also almost in like, I know they don't mean it that way, but it's almost insulting to the people who have worked their ass off and still yeah. aren't like that big. Like, and one example I love to give, and it's not, I don't mean it as a negative way towards him. Cause I've, I've when he was on the podcast, Brad Loomis, um, we talked about it. And one of the things I said is like, I really respect you because you kind of are like the every man's like bodybuilder. Like you've been doing this for, 25 years you're you compete at like maybe 160 something yeah. like that and he looks good on stage but he's oh yeah and he, he said himself he's probably the least impressive of the men in 3dmj and yeah. so to me it's like okay so tell him who has the top coaches right supposedly the top natural coaches yeah. in the world around him consistent for 25 years tell him he's doing something wrong right because right. he's competing at 160 so what is he doing wrong is he not consistent why don't his calves look like jeff albert's calves right why sure. eric helms just competed and he looks fantastic i think he maybe yeah. he was second i mean he did a few shows yeah but look at him next to jeff albert's right he right. gets dominated and they tell eric helms he's doing something wrong right like you got to get another phd to figure out what's going on right it's just sure. it, it's so it's almost insulting to the people who have been consistent like, yeah, 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 yeah th this is always, I mean, I've been in this industry and, and watched this, you know, forever. And it's, it's always had a couple of problems. One is that the American attitude is you can do anything if you work hard enough. And I got bad news for you. No, you can't. <laughs> um, sorry. You, it's not just comes down to just work ethic. Eventually I've had people, oh, there's no such thing as genetics. Okay. Um, All right. I just can't, All right. I, it's not even an argument <laughs> I'd be bothered to have anymore. Right. And, but then you've also got in bodybuilding, I think more so than in other sports, you've got a skewed perspective, right? I know a guy years ago on my old forum, and he is like 195, lean. I'm like, dude, you're at your limits. You can go crush any natural contest with like a month of dieting, and he would not believe me. He's like, nope, I'm small. You don't know my work ethic. I can do this. I can do that. Mm. And the last time I looked, he was 300 pounds of lard because he thought he really? could make himself big. And oh, he was wow. actually speaker pound for pound. And I'm like, okay, when you diet back down, you're going to be just as big, as big as you were before. But what happened is, We've got this. So a guy, a dude at one eighty-five, it's a twelve percent body fat. Mm -hmm. Like I don't know what how big that he will look big. You will look That's at it and go yeah. and go. That is a guy that works out. I can tell he looks it right. And then you go. There is a bodybuilder who's ripped at three hundred pounds. Mm -hmm. I have seen Ronnie Coleman in person. He looks like 
another species. And I'm not saying that, it's not, <laughs> I'm not saying it is negative, but the, yeah. the dude takes up two first class seats. Like when you see him, like if you've ever looked at, you know, the Belgian blue, the myostatin null bull, blue, bull, that's what you pick. So like perspective is totally skewed. Arnold sure. competed at like 220 to 240, depending on which number you believe. He was gigantic. And he, right. yeah. he used, based on what we know, they were on, presumably they use a lot less than what folks are using now. Like Lou Ferrigno, I think, was up at 240, 260, but he's also very tall. He was gigantic. Right. You have pros now competing at 320. Right. Right. 80 pounds heavier than Arnold at his peak. A guy at 185 who looks, who's big and is trained, is going to look at that and go, I don't even work out. Right. And it, oh, just, sure. it totally it, it, in the same way, you know, and, you know, it's it's the men's equivalent of whether it's women's fitness or these super skinny, you know, whatever is models. And you go, you know, I work out hard. I'm in good shape. I look and you go. Yeah, I I'm terrible. Like, I'm awful. I'm I'm Boot jobs. And the other, yeah. And you're in you're, or you're seeing them. The, the, the photo shoot they did the one day of the year that their contest lean. And without realizing that they look like that, like one day out of the year, and you don't see them in the off season. It's true of men and yeah. women. I'm not trying to pick on women. A lot of those, right, people, right. those, if you saw them in the off season, they just looked like they look like every other American, um, right. just bigger, more muscular. But they they don't stay that lean year round by and large. Right. But yeah, so you get this really skewed perspective. You got this attitude of it's all just how hard you work and putting in the time, and it's like, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I, I mean, I wish it weren't true. Um, right. Dan Duchesne well, let me ask, uh, go, oh, Sorry, go ahead. I was going to ask a personal question because something, now that you and I have talked a few times, I've gotten yeah. more into like something, that's, things that you've done, some of your training. Yeah. Um, one thing I've never heard anybody ask you is, because you, you talk about the steroid aspect a lot, did you ever consider taking it or was it just never worth it to you? I did. Uh, for me, it was more of a, an, it was like a, more of a clinical, like a, an interest from an intellectual standpoint. Like I always wanted mm. to play with them, but the legalities of it made the mm. risk far too high for me. It was just like, I would love to, but it's not worth risking losing all my stuff. Um, you know, I don't presume, I suppose it's easier now, I guess with some of the underground labs and stuff. So like, and I'm, I'm getting to that age, you know, where things are starting to not work as well. And it's probably, you know, Austin's got lots of quack hormone replacement. Sure. Oh, I'm sure you could get it very easily. Um, yeah, so it's like, you know, I, I've got a buddy, and he's on it, and he actually was living in uh, Taiwan, and literally, you can go to the pharmacy and without a prescription, just go, uh, I want Sustanon 250, and they'll give it to you. Like, right. Awesome. But, I mean, you know, he's on it. I've got several friends here in Austin that are on it. For are you considering, like, TRT levels, or you're talking, like, super physiological? I would probably just be, you know, even TRT levels, because I did. I got checked, you know, for most of my life, my testosterone was, like, right around 300. Mm. Um which is why and that's a great. And again, looking at physiology, like I got pretty strong for my size. Didn't, but then again, I look back at my training. I'm like, I did a lot of that low volume, super high. You know, I, I wish that I could train myself then with what I know now, and I bet it would have been very different. Um, but I was a great endurance athlete. That's just yeah. kind of what I was more built for and wired for physiologically. So I uh, did pretty well at that. Um, so yeah, you know, I would probably get to that point where it will be time for either hormone replacement or at least the little blue pills. Right, right. <laughs> getting all sucks. Don't do it, man. It's it's a trap. So I'll try to avoid it.